Thank you. Um, and, and thank you to those in the audience. I appreciate your attending. Um, I'm going to do just my quick dis, dis, uh, obligatory disclosure uh, slide. I do want to give some credit to the Foundation to Advance Brain Injury Rehabilitation's paper. Um, so the study that I'll be reviewing today and, and, and talking about uh, was we, we got significant assistance from uh, Dr. Jim Malik, and, and Dr. Malik is the principal investigator for Faber. Uh, we are, and Faber is a, a collaborative of post-acute brain injury providers who are, we're pooling our outcome data to better understand uh, what, what, what makes for better outcomes in, in post-acute brain injury uh, re rehabilitation and recovery. So I do want to give, give Faber a quick, a quick shout out for Dr. Malik's work with us. So I'm going to spend some time today talking about this idea of effort. Here, here's the basic um, topic list for the day. I want to sort of unpack what, what is, when we think about this concept of effort, what is it? Um, I want to go through this, a study that we recently did looking at um, effort and outcomes in post-acute rehab. And then I want to spend the, the last few minutes of the, or the last portion of the presentation talking about sort of how do you, how have we started to wrap our heads around our processes around our uh, rehabilitation around this idea of getting the best effort possible out of, out of the people we serve. Um, so that's sort of the to-do list for the next hour or so. Um, I do... I, I want to, I'm, I'm sort of in this stage of my uh, career where I, I, I guess it depends, depends on the perspective. If you ask my wife, I'm about uh, two thirds to three quarters of the way through my career. If you ask my 401k, I'm only about halfway through my career, but I'm sort of reaching the point where probably more of my career is behind me than ahead of me. And so, you know, I, I'm, sort of looking back on my career and thinking about what the rest of my career looks like and what what do I want to when I'm done with this when I you know when I move on from this this field what what do I want to have left behind and I think one of the best ways to for me to sort of explain that is with a story um, and so I'm going to tell you a quick story I uh, heard it years and years ago, and I honestly don't even remember where I heard it, um, but it really it resonated with me. So here's the, the story is that a man's walking along one day and, and he falls into a hole. Unsure what to do, he, he calls out for help. Um, so he's, he's calling out for help and a physician walks by. And the physician looks down the hole and the man looks up at him and says, I'm stuck in a hole. Can you help me? And the physician says, I know just what you need. And he gets out his prescription pad and he writes a script and he drops it down the hole to the man and the physician goes on his way. And the man is still stuck in a hole. So he continues to call out and pretty soon a uh, minister walks by. And the minister looks down the hole at him and the man looks up and says, I'm stuck in a hole. Can you help me? And the minister says, I know just what you need. And he kneels down and says a prayer and then goes on his, his way. And the man is still stuck in a hole. So he continues to call out. And pretty soon a friend walks by and he looks down the hole at the man. And the man looks up and says, I'm stuck in a hole. Can you help me? And the, the friend jumps down into the hole with him. And the man says, what are you doing? Now we're both stuck in a hole. And the friend says, don't worry, we'll find a way out together. And I, I tell that story, you know, I have to sort of give the caveat that I, I'm not, in, in telling that story, I'm in no way disparaging uh, medicine and the role of, of, of medicine in, 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 in what we do. You know, we know that, that the role of medicine is huge in, in brain injury and brain injury recovery. Um, and I in no way am intending to disparage faith. 
Um, you know, I, I know from personal experience and we know from, from a degree of, of evidence that individuals who uh, have a basis in faith tend to get better, better than individuals who don't. So I know that faith plays a huge role in the recovery process. I tell the story because we, in healthcare in particular, and I have noted that I think COVID has maybe made this worse. We, we in healthcare have a real tendency to stand over the top of the hole look down at the people in the hole and drop our interventions down to them. And, you know, I think when I look back on my career and I think about what I want to leave behind, ultimately, I want, I want to have emphasized or better illuminated the ways in which we can jump down into that hole and illuminate the climb out. Um, so that's, that's sort of where I am. So whether you're listening to this presentation or if you've heard other presentations by me, or if you hear future presentations from me, this is sort of a, a, the theme that weaves its way through, um, the work that I do, sort of the passion that I have for this population and for rehabilitation for individuals with acquired brain injury. Um, and so that's, that sort of that common thread. So understanding that, let's talk, let's sort of talk about this idea of effort. Um, and, you know, when we think about the, the ability to get effort out of the people we serve, and uh, sometimes you'll hear the term uh, effort used interchangeably with engagement, you know, engagement in rehabilitation, engagement in therapy, engagement in recovery. Um, sometimes you'll hear it uh, equated with participation, participation in therapy. Um, you know, in general, there's this agreement that effort is not sort of a, a, an independent construct. It's ra rather it's a it's a combination of lots of different constructs. Um, there are a number of rating scales that are publicly available for uh, for rating effort. Uh, by individuals who are undergoing rehabilitation. The most common is the RITS or the Rehab Intensity of Therapy Scale. And on the screen, you'll see uh, the reference for that uh, from a number of years ago. Um, in general, effort is not well studied, whether we're talking about this idea of engagement, participation, effort, it, it's not well studied at all, especially uh, when we think about post-acute brain injury or post-hospital brain injury rehabilitation. Um, you know, when I try to conceptualize effort, you know, and think about what, what is it, what plays into it, what are the different constructs that make it up, uh, this is sort of my thought process. There are sort of three umbrella concepts that affect effort, can, can make for better effort, can make for uh, more challenges with effort, and those include your various cognitive and emotional factors. There are sort of medical clinical state factors, and then there's this idea of treatment design. And the bulk of this presentation, and really the spirit of the research that I'm going to sort of talk you through here in a bit, is born out of that bottom so that bottom blue circle, the idea of uh, how do we create an environment in which uh, we, we are able to get the most effort out of individuals. Now, obviously, we have to address the, the top two bubbles as well, and there are lots of ways that we do that. But really, again, the, the spirit of the research was born out of this idea that there's there are these additional competencies that go along with, you know, if you're going to work with individuals with acquired brain injury, you, you have to rely on more than just core competencies. There are these competencies that sort of go along with generating effort and making rehabilitation engaging and making it make sense and um, personalizing it. Uh, and, that, and that, again, is really where this whole idea to study effort came from. So at the time um, we started rating effort at On With Life, 
uh, at least in our in our inpatient program, 28 bed inpatient post acute post hospital rehabilitation setting. Um, that RITS, the rehab intensity of therapy scale, was not it had not been published yet, and so we we knew that we wanted to look into this idea of effort, engagement, and rehabilitation. And so we developed our own Likert scale. Um, and and um, we call it the ABI LOES or the ABLES. Um, and it's just a, a scale, a Likert scale for measuring effort. Uh, and each session provided by our therapist, whether it's physical therapy, occupational speech, music therapy, rec therapy, each session, um, when, when that clinician goes in to document that session, they uh, give a level of effort rating uh, for the individual for that specific session. Um, you know, as we were, as when we came to the decision to that we wanted to actually do some uh, research based on this, we did go ahead and do a, um, assessment of all the clinicians, the scenario-based assessment for all the clinicians, they had to go through and, and rate uh, effort based on, I don't, I don't know, six or seven vignettes. And the reliability across the 26 clinicians was 0.96. So very, very high reliability for the scale itself. So we, you know, on with life, Historically, we haven't done a whole lot of in-house research. Um, you know, we've done a few smaller things. We primarily serve as a, a site, a recruitment site for other uh, types of studies. We've done uh, some studies on, uh, contributed to some studies on disorders of consciousness, use of antidepressants in brain injury. So there's there's a number of topics that we've contributed to research on, but this is probably the first major uh, in-house study done um, by, by On With Life. Uh, so understanding that we are not biostatisticians, we partnered with the University of Iowa uh, in their biostatistics department. So Dr. Uh, Newt Carter and Sarah Perry are the two individuals from the University of Iowa that did our uh, statistical analyses and assisted us with the paper, with that those aspects of the paper. Um, so I want to make sure we give them credit. Um, the objective was to sort of look at this idea uh, of effort and look at the role, investigate the role of effort uh, in, in terms of outcomes. Look at, uh, do a, a retrospective sort of observational cohort study on comparing effort look, or looking at the relationship between effort and outcomes. Uh, we had about 101 individuals uh, uh, admissions to our post-acute inpatient program. Average age uh, for those individuals was about 52, if memory serves. Uh, average length of stay was around two and a half months, 60 to 70 days, somewhere in there. Um, more males than females, and probably two, if memory serves, about two thirds of the individuals were folks with young stroke. Um, so about maybe a third traumatic brain injury, two thirds young stroke. Um, the two primary outcome measures that we used were the Mayo Portland Adaptability Inventory. So well, uh, well studied, um, assessment of individuals in the uh, post-hospital uh, recovery period. Uh, and then we also use the supervision rating scale. So I, would, I do wanna take just a minute or two to run, 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 run you through those assessments. So the Mayo Portland, many of you are probably familiar with the Mayo Portland. Um, 36 items on the Mayo Portland, 29 of which contribute to the um, total score. Uh, there are three indexes that are uh, yielded th through the, the, the Mayo Portland. The first is the ability index. So these are, you know, for those of you who are used to FIM scoring, this is your basic sensory, motor, cognitive, your, your sort of nuts and bolts functions. Uh, there's also the adjustment index, which looks more 
you know, aptly at adjustment, things like mood. Um, there's some cognitive pieces to that, uh, insight into uh, deficits, and then there's the participation index. And participation refers to what's called life participation. So really the, the participation index looks at those skills that underscore individuals' ability to return to their roles. Um, so returning to social roles, returning to family roles, returning to vocational roles, um, the, those are sort of the areas that are, that are addressed in the participation index. And then there's also a total score in addition to those three, those three indexes. Um, of note, you know, when you assess the clinical utility of interventions intended to improve outcomes, um, we, we have to think about, so what amount of improvement is important to the people we serve, right? What do, do, are we, is rehabilitation affecting change that is meaningful change to, to that person served or to that family? And so, one of the kind of neat things about the Mayo Portland is they they have determined uh, that if you can make a five point change um, from in in your in a Mayo Portland in one of the indexes or in the total score um, that that's considered MCID or a minimally clinically important difference. And what uh, MCID is this? It's a person centered concept, so it captures. Uh, both the magnitude of improvement and then also the value the the individual or the person served places on that change. So uh, MCID, that five point change is the the amount of change that is necessary for that person served to recognize and find of value the the change that has has occurred. So, you know, as individuals go through rehabilitation, we really shoot for at least MCID in terms of improvement on the Mayo Portland, and and hopefully we can get a nine point change, which which is considered a robust clinically important difference. So that's that's the Mayo Portland. Just a quick overview of the Mayo Portland. The uh, second scale is called the Supervision Rating Scale, um, and just as the name implies, it looks at the amount of supervision that an, indi an individual needs or an individual requires in order to remain safe. Um, there's, it's a 13-point uh, ordinal scale that is then broken down into five categories that you see again on the, on the slide there. And the, the reference for that, the SRS is, is available uh, at the bottom. Um, both the SRS and the Mayo Portland, if you're interested in learning more about those um, assessments, are available on the Combi website. So Combi, C-O-M-B-I dot O-R-G, stands for the Center for Outcome Measurement in Brain Injury, and I believe both of those scales are available free to the public on that, uh, on that website. Or they're downloadable. So what were the findings? You know, what, what, what did we discover um, when we, after we did the statistical analysis? So again, we had 101 individuals in the study. They received on average about 240 effort ratings across their rehabilitation length of stay. Um, and we looked specifically, we did not look at uh, music therapy or recreational therapy. We, we did PTOT speech, at least for this first uh, paper. We're in the process of writing a second paper that looks more specifically at, at music therapy and rec therapy. Um, but you know, when, from a PTOT speech standpoint, again, there were about, on average, about 240 effort ratings across the, the length of stay. Length of stay again was about 65-ish days. Uh, the way we did uh, the outcome measures, so both the SRS and the Mayo Portland, they're done on admission uh, within the first three days or so of, of an individual's rehabilitation stay, and they're done uh, at the time of discharge. And both of those assessments are done by team consensus. So you get the team together to provide the ratings and agree on the, on the uh, 
on those ratings. So our colleagues at the University of Iowa then performed a number of statistical analyses looking at the relationships among uh, level of effort, the two outcome measures, and other salient factors, things like uh, sex, diagnosis, length of stay, treatment environment related to COVID. This happened to be a cohort that uh, about halfway through, so about half of these individuals were treated and discharged prior to COVID, and about half of these individuals came um, in sort of in the early uh, days of and, and months of, of COVID. So, which really sort of fundamentally changed sort of the rehabilitation environment for those individuals. So we thought it would be interesting to look at uh, whether COVID was uh, statistically, if there was a statistically significant difference between individuals treated during COVID, you know, when families could not be there, um, there was much more isolation. You had, of course, masking, gloving, gowning, sort of very, uh, a much less personal sort of rehabilitation experience for those individuals. And, and we'll talk, uh, and you, you'll, later on the slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So when we specifically looked at factors that were associated with the greatest change on Mayo Portland, so from admission to discharge, right, who changed the most? What we found was that um, individuals who had a higher mean or a higher average length of uh, a level of effort that higher level of effort was significantly associated with greater change on the Mayo Portland. Um, for individuals who had a lower admission Mayo Portland, and, and one of the sort of confusing things about the Mayo Portland is lower is better. Lower A, a lower score on the Mayo Portland indicates better functioning. A higher score on the Mayo Portland indicates more challenges or higher level of challenge. So for individuals who were performing better on, uh, on admission, there was a significant association with greater change sort of across the, the rehabilitation stay. Individuals who were younger at admission, that was associated, you know, younger age was associated with greater change on the Mayo Portland. And then individuals who had a shorter time frame from injury to rehab admission, those individuals also had a uh, statistically significant difference in uh, change on the Mayo Portland. Um, we did not find significant associations between standard deviation and level of effort. So for some individuals, for example, you had uh, very low effort early in rehabilitation, very high effort later. Um, so the, the sort of the differences in level, level of effort across the rehabilitation stay, that, that was not significant in terms of outcomes. And that's, that's why we felt comfortable going with the average, uh, you know, so just averaging those 240 effort ratings. Uh, we, we saw no difference between sex and level of change, condition and level of change, or length of stay and change. And the one thing that really surprised me was the treatment environment. I expected for individuals who were treated during COVID to have uh, less change, for there to be a, uh, a an association, a negative association with change on the Mayo Portland, just because of the, again, the really profound way in which ways in which COVID uh, affected rehabilitation. A few more findings. So we looked specifically at reduction in the need for supervision. So we did that using this, the SRS. Um, and what we found, again, similarly to the Mayo Portland, higher mean level of effort was associated with more significant reduction in supervision. Lower need for supervision on admission was associated with more significant reduction in supervision across the rehab. And then lower age was also associated with more significant reduction in supervision across rehab. So notably, we found that for every one unit increase in level of effort across the rehabilitation stay, we saw an association with a total score Mayo Portland change of MCID. So that's it, you know, that's what this is sort of the outcome that uh, 
uh, hit hit my heart the most because this is you know again I, I found this notable because statistically significant change is one thing um and and is important I don't want to downplay the importance of statistical significance it's a, it's it's important but when you combine statistically significant change that is also personally meaningful or it makes a difference to the individual undergoing re undergoing rehabilitation that's in my mind that's sort of the holy grail ultimately we want rehabilitation to um we we want rehab to make people feel more like the people they want to be and and so you know when i noted that the difference just one unit if we can get one more unit of effort out of these individuals we could make a meaningful clinically important difference that's 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 a big deal from a from a rehabilitation standpoint um one more finding that sort of underscores the connection between meaning meaningful change and effort uh, individuals were 8.34 times uh, more likely to achieve MCID with every one unit increase in effort. Oh, did I jump over one? Here we go. Okay. Understanding the results thus far, it logically follows that the higher or more impaired an individual's admission Mayo Portland, the more challenging level level of effort was for that individual. So essentially that's what that top bullet means. Um, and then I wanna talk, so everything up to this point has been correlation. Correlation is different than causation. We know based on the findings from this study that um, higher effort is correlated with better outcomes, at least measured by the Mayo Portland and the, the supervision rating scale. We do not know, we cannot say that higher effort causes better outcomes. That's a, that's a much more sort of, there's a much higher level of proof required in order to say something causes something else. Um, but there is, and, and generally in research, so if you want to determine causality, if you want to say that something causes a, an outcome, you have to, the, the usual pathway to that is through what's called a placebo-controlled, double-blind, randomized control trial. So you have a group that receives an inter intervention, and you have a group that does not receive an intervention, and they don't know. They don't know who's receiving it, who's not. Uh, the researchers don't know who's receiving it and who's not, um, and so that that that's sort of how you determine causality. It's a very sort of complicated and robust type of study that that is done to prove causality. There are, for some of these sort of retrospective observational cohort studies, there are some uh, statistical analyses that can be done that can help imply causality. And so we did, and one of those uh, analyses is called a propensity score, exploratory propensity score. So that exploratory propensity score suggests that there could be a potential causal effect of mean level of effort on outcome. We can't state that we know for sure that it causes effort, causes outcomes to be different, but this, this limited um, analysis does sort of start to imply that. And so we need to repeat some of the research. We need to repeat it with a higher N, a higher number of individuals. We need other organizations and, and researchers to uh, replicate, try to replicate this study. Um, and, you know, hopefully if you get enough people in enough different settings, then you can use this type of an analysis and and to to get to the the idea of causation, which would be a very very big deal. Okay, um, so now that we've sort of taken a look at the research side, the research outcomes, um, I want to take 
a step back to this idea of illuminating the climb, right? Um, which again, sort of informed the spirit of the study was born out of this idea that there are two sets of complementary competencies required really to be who our person served and families need us to be. Um, so we think about those competencies, irrespective of discipline, we all have core competencies, right? We have, uh, you know, I, as a speech language pathologist, went to school, learned core competencies. I go to workshops, I go to presentations, I learn more core competencies. Um, and that's, that's great. Whether you're a speech therapist or a physical therapist or a physician or a nurse, you all have sort of these core competencies that, that sort of surround this idea of looking at a human being breaking them down, breaking that human being down into their component parts, evaluating and treating. Um, and that set of core competencies is, is all good and fine as long as you have a, a patient or a person served who can infer. So what do, what do I mean by that? Um, you know, I've had to, I'm, I'm a runner, I injured my Achilles at one point, I had to go to physical therapy, and I hated it. I did not want to do it, I didn't like it, it hurt. There were a hundred things I would have rather done. But because my prefrontal cortex is at least somewhat intact, I could infer that, okay, if I do this thing that the physical therapist is wanting me to do, if I follow my home exercise program, if I follow their recommendations, my long-term outcome, even though I don't like doing these things right now, if I do them, my long-term outcome will be better. I will get better, better if, if, I, if I do these things. Well, that prefrontal area, that part of the brain that allows us to infer is the most often injured part of the, the brain for individuals with acquired brain injury, whether you have individual with a traumatic injury that's traumatic in origin, or even, you know, if you think about blood perfusion into the prefrontal cortex, uh, many of our individuals with non-traumatic injury, stroke, for example. So in, we have to be able to, you know, our person served, you know, unlike me, I did it because I did what the therapist wanted me to do because the therapist told me what to do and I, I got the long-term piece of that. The people we serve are often have reduced capacity to infer. So they, they don't tend to just do it because we tell them to do it. Um, and so what that means is you have to have the second set of, of competencies. And, and the best way I would describe them is engagement-based competencies, right? How do, I, uh, how do I figure out what makes this person tick? How do I figure out what they love? How do I figure out what their dreams are? Not just their goals, but also their dreams. And how do I weave that into my core competencies. And so that's really, again, that was the spirit from which the, the study was born. And I wanna spend, again, I wanna spend the, the rest of, of the talk here sort of digging more into what are some ways that we, we do that, or we tr at least try to do that. We're trying to, to build a, a rehabilitation experience that really gets at that, that idea of engagement. Um, so the two, the two basic concrete ways in which we structure our world at, at On With Life to try to, to address person-served engagement, improve person-served engagement, get as much effort as we possibly can out of the people we serve, are the idea of person-centered rehabilitation and then um, a thought, there's sort of a thought process is called EDSO, which is an acronym for endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. So we're going to take a little bit of a look at, at those two with the few minutes that we have left here. So person-centered rehabilitation. Again, I could do an entire presentation on this topic alone. Um, 
and obviously that's outside the scope of this specific webinar, uh, but I do, I do want to take a little bit of time to hit on just a few highlights. So there's several core competencies or sort of core concepts um, associated with person-centered rehabilitation. Sort of the big overarching concept is this idea of with, that rehabilitation is not provided to the people we serve. Rehabilitation is best provided with. Um, when I interviewed, I've been at On With Life for about 20, uh, shoot, 20, it'll be 21 years in August. And when, at the time I interviewed, the administrator brought me into the uh, therapy gym and he, at the time, our uh, dress code was whatever the families are wearing, that's what you're wearing, right? If families are wearing jeans and t-shirts, then that's, that's what the rehabilitation provider is wearing. And he, so we walked into the gym and he said, as you look around, you, you should not be able to tell the difference between family members and staff. And it, it very much sort of hit home this idea of with, that we are, we're doing this with them. We're not doing this to them. This is not a transactional kind of uh, service that we're doing. Um, so what, how is rehabilitation being experienced by the individuals that we serve? Uh, and, and there's sort of three ways in which we think about person-centered person rehab, um, th three core areas that, that sort of have influence over that. The first is that personal professional dyad, which is that specific interactional relationship between the provider and the person served or the provider and the family. Um, and so there are dynamics associated with that, that relationship that um, can be either person-centered or not. Um, the microsystem level. So for example, the team, how, how a team in healthcare functions really drives the ways in which rehabilitation is administered and whether that rehabilitation is administered in a person-centered way or not. So one of what one of the sort of points I like to make when I talk about this microsystem level or the team level is this idea of we and they. So you know we all, I think probably most of us work in organizations with different departments. And the, the words we use matter. If, if I refer to, because I spend, my primary time is spent in our inpatient program. If I refer to our inpatient program as we, and our outpatient program as they, or our corporate staff as they, or our long-term program as they, that really defines the boundaries of a team. And the same thing is true, you know, if we if we use the word we to refer to our immediate team and the families or the person served as they, that really that defines the boundary of a there's a relational boundary there that that those words imply. And so I have over the last year or so, since I read, there's a study on the, and it's referenced on the next slide, but since I read this, this study, I have really tried to eliminate this idea of we, they, from my, um, from my emails to within the organization, when I communicate with the team, I really put forth a lot of effort to avoid to, to refer to families as we, to refer, for, to person served as we, to refer to all departments and, and subsets of the organization as we, and it makes a difference. Um, so the next is what's called the macro system level. And the macro system level has to do with your organizational sort of beliefs and the way the organization, your organizational philosophies and 
uh, how your policies and procedures reflect and allow and prioritize person-centered care um, over organization-centric ideas. So things like, you know, I personally, um, I manage a team of, of therapists, a large team, a, a large therapy team, and there are productivity expectations, for example. Um, there, there have to be productivity expectations. The difference is that the productivity is not the focus. I've worked for other rehabilitation entities, organizations where productivity is the only focus. And the only feedback that I got as a clinician had to do with how much, how many billable units I was providing. And what I can tell you is that when I worked in those organizations, that that sort of philosophy, that approach did not promote person-centered rehabilitation because for the simple fact that as I, as I walked in the doors of the organization in, in the morning, my mind was on how many sessions do I have to do? And since I've moved into a leadership position, I have sort of purposefully set the, this idea of productivity on the, on the back burner. Clinicians do not receive feedback on level of productivity. And the, sort of the, the point is, the reason for that is that I don't want clinicians walking through the door and thinking, what do I do? How many sessions do I have to do today? Right, because that's that's a clinician-centered thought. It's an organization said, "How much do I need to get done, and how much does the organization want me to get done?" That thought, those thought processes, in and of themselves, are not person-centered. Right, I want clinicians to walk through the door and think, "What do what what do my person serve need, and how do I make sure that I apply that." I provide that in the best possible way. And what I found over 12 years of having that philosophy is that if, if I could create an environment where that is the thought process, what, what, do, what, what do my person serve need? What do my families need? How do I best provide that? The productivity takes care of itself. That other stuff takes care of itself. Um, the other quick example of sort of the macro system level that sort of is at top of my mind was when On With Life was started, our founding, the family, the founding families who started On With Life would not open the, the doors. They would not open the doors until there was a music therapist on staff. Um, it was just they had seen the effect of music therapy on their loved ones, and they were not going to open a brain injury rehab facility without a music therapist. So that's a just a quick sort of high level overview of the concepts associated with person centered rehabilitation. There's the reference uh, the, it was published uh, in the archives in January of 2022 and it's. I've got, I've got to always have that study sitting right next to me, sitting right next to me on a shelf. Um, so there are lots of, there have been lots of studies on, and you, you hear all kinds of different terms, patient-centered care, uh, person-centered care in various settings, dentistry, ER, uh, nursing home care. Uh, but really this study, the study on this slide is the first that has been done on person-centered rehabilitation uh, specifically. Um, one of the points that they make in the paper is that we all think we do it, right? If you poll healthcare providers and ask them to rate how person-centered is, is the care they provide, um, and then you pull the person served patients and families and ask them how person-centered was the care that was provided to you, 
there is a significant disconnect between those two. Healthcare providers tend to far overestimate just how person-centered their care is as compared to the perceptions of uh, the people they serve. So when we're working with, when we're training clinicians, when we're thinking about this idea of how do we set up an organization that that puts forth this idea of, of uh, person-centered care, one of the first points that's made is this idea of minimizing or avoiding protocols. And that in healthcare, that makes a lot of us very, very uncomfortable um, because we are trained, what is the protocol? What is the process? Um, and, you know, I, the, the point here is that the more protocolized an approach is in rehabilitation specifically, we're not talking about other aspects of healthcare. If someone has pneumonia, you want them to follow the you want the healthcare providers to follow the protocols. Uh, if someone's in the ER, you want someone to follow the protocols. But when we move into this um, rehab model, as opposed to a medical model, we need to really think carefully about the protocols that we use, because the more protocolized we are, the less person-centered we are. Um, this idea of prioritizing the relationship over all else um, and really adopting the perspective of the individual who's experiencing the rehabilitation. You know, I've, when, when I do training with clinicians, you think about that initial evaluation, right? And there's sort of a laundry list of things that clinicians need to uh, do and a laundry list of information that they need to get during that initial evaluation. And really the single most important thing they can do in that first interaction with that person served and that first interaction with that family is not to gain a bunch of clinical information, but rather to start to build a relationship with that individual. And there's a we have to think about, you know, if, if we're going in again with my priority, I have to get A, B, C, and D done. What you're doing is you're sacrificing the relationship for the tasks that you have, believe you have to accomplish. And so we have to, I think, at the corporate level, at the leadership level, we have to let clinicians know that it's okay to not get all of that information, that it's okay to build that relationship. Um, connects with person served outside of required time. So Kathy Herring, uh, some of you may know Kathy Herring. Kathy is one of the founding families for On With Life. And On With Life was um, the, the sort of milieu for On With Life was born out of some experiences that Kathy Herring had uh, when her son, was at Craig Rehabilitation. And when she she would take her son, who'd had a brain injury and a spinal cord injury, to Craig Rehabilitation for uh, annual evaluations. And when she went there, she would stay with a staff member. Staff members would say, hey, if, if you need a place to stay, you can stay with me. And, you know, she always talked about sitting in the cafeteria and one of her son's physicians coming through, seeing her sitting in the cafeteria, grabbing a cup of coffee, coming over and just having a 10-minute conversation with her. But she'd never really experienced a healthcare environment where that happened, that a physician would actually come over and have a converse, an unsolicited sort of conversation about real things with her. And it again, sort of embedded this idea of connecting with, with our person served in our families outside of just that required session time. Um, and then it requires a little bit of vulnerability. It requires us to have conversations that can be very challenging, right? You think about uh, when, a, when there's a difficult prognosis, um, when progress is slow, uh, when addressing grief, when um, a person served or family is making comparisons of that individual now with the, the pre-injury person. You know, how do you how do you navigate that? 
the picture there is a physical therapist with a, a person served and that person served you know when he first came to into the program if i had told the team that that picture would someday be taken they would have never believed me he was uh it had a lot of difficulty with effort, had a lot of difficulty with engagement for a wide variety of reasons. But as the relationship between his, he, as his team built the relationship with him, he, and, and got a little bit vulnerable with him, he sort of came out of his shell and um, had a, had a really, really good and quite unexpected outcome. So that's person-centered rehabilitation. Um, the second concept that we uh, apply in order to help with effort uh, or try to address effort engagement in rehabilitation is this idea of EDSO. And EDSO sort of gets back to this idea of the basic human emotion of happiness, right? We've all felt that. We, have, we, we all, hopefully all of you know what it feels like to feel happy, right? To have that sense that life is good. We've all felt that before. Those feelings come from neurotransmitters. And many, many years ago, I had to do a professionalism in service for On With Life, and I didn't know anything about professionalism. So I went to the library and I checked out several books, uh, two of which were the two on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, Start with why and leaders eat last. Start with why is all about aligning uh, your personal why with your organization's why. You know what's what's my reason? Why why am I here? And if you you know if you can if you can find an organization that aligns itself well that is in agreement with your why, that makes for um, a, a a fulfilling career. And and so that's the start with why piece. Leaders Eat Last had a section on uh, EDSO, which sort of speaks to this idea of helping people feel happy and um, that happiness is generated through neurotransmitters, many of which are listed here, endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. Some of those are some of the biggies. There are lots of others. Um, but uh, those are those are the four that Simon sort of concentrates on in Leaders Eat Last. And, and so I read the book and applied this idea of EDSO to our work environment, did the professionalism in service. And a couple of weeks later, I uh, needed to step in and do a session with a, uh, an individual named Mary. Mary, you can see her, her, uh, information up there, Mary was going through a rough spot and she was uh, doing some executive functioning things in speech therapy. And I started doing this session and it just, I could tell very quickly that Mary wasn't, wasn't with it. She wasn't engaged. She wasn't putting forth effort. And so I sort of stopped and I said, Mary, you know, we've got, I, I you know, I asked her about herself. These, she gave me this information that you see on the screen. And I said, Mary, we've got about half an hour what's one, if we can accomplish one thing in the next half hour that will make it feel to you like this has been worth it, your time with me has been worth it, what would that one thing be? Um, and Mary said, I just want to be happier. <laughs> and I thought my initial response was, oh, crap, what do I, what do, I do with that? And uh, so I had just done this, this presentation on professionalism that was all about happiness and the chemicals that help us feel that way. So I talked Mary through these concepts. Endorphins are all about exercise, right? How, how often are we getting up? How often are we getting moving? Um, because the better we do cardiovascular, from a cardiovascular standpoint, the, the, the better we feel. I'm, I'm a runner. I'm a walker. I do that in the morning before I come to work. And my days are better when I do that than they are when I don't. The next one is dopamine. Dopamine is all about goals and setting goals and visually tracking how we're doing on our goals and making sure our goals um, relate to our dreams in life and making sure that we're concretely seeing that we're becoming the people that we want to be. 
And then serotonin. Serotonin is based on uh, this idea of accomplishment. Uh, you know, am I growing? Am I learning something? Am I um, becoming a person who is of who is is, is gaining in value? Um, and we do that in all kinds of ways. And then the oxytocin. Oh, is oxytocin? Oxytocin is all about. Um, relationships. It's all about connection with other human beings. It's all about uh, giving of your time, giving of your energy, giving of your resources without accepting, uh, expecting anything in return. Um, and so I talked through all of these things sort of in depth with Mary. And at the end of the session, um, Mary set some goals. So the, again, the first thing she did was she, we got out a piece of paper and she was going to write down some goals. So right there, we've got the dopamine, right? Do, writing down things and checking them off, that gives you a little hit of dopamine. It feels good to do that. Those of us who are list makers sort of understand that it feels good to cross things off your list. And so we, we had the dopamine down just by Mary sort of writing out a list of things she wanted to do. Um, Mary was a walker before her injury. It's been an e a year since her injury and she hadn't walked, not because she couldn't walk, but because she didn't walk. And so she set a goal that she was going to walk a mile between then and the next session, session about a week later. And uh, so now we've got the dopamine with the list. We're checking things off. And we've got the endorphins where we're going to get out. We're going to get our heart rate up. And, and so we've got the E and the D in EDSO. The next thing she decided was, you know, pr prior to her injury, she had been a um, an Al-Anon uh, leader. She actually had been a facilitator for Al-Anon meetings, and um, she hadn't been to a meeting since her injury. And so she decided she was going to get back to at least one Al-Anon meeting uh, between then and her next session. And then, so now we've got the serotonin, right? We're adding value. The last thing was uh, oxytocin. And oxytocin, again, is about giving without expecting anything in return. It's about building relationships. And Mary was a cook. She had lost her job, but her job prior to her injury, she, she'd been a cook at a school. And she made really, really good pies. It was sort of her specialty. She had a new neighbor and she decided she was going to bake a pie for that neighbor. So now we've got the E, the endorphins from the walk. We've got the D, the dopamine from the list. We've got the S, the serotonin from getting back to Al-Anon. And we've got the O, the oxytocin from baking this pie and giving it to a, a, a new neighbor. And I saw Mary a, a couple weeks later she happened to be in the clinic and I asked her how things were doing and this didn't fix her life. I'm not, you know, I'm not that Pollyannish about all of this, but she, she did tell me she had met all of those goals and that she had set new ones and that she did feel a little bit happier. So with that, that is the end of the presentation and I am at two o'clock on the dot. I apologize. I didn't leave time for uh, questions. I'm happy to stay on late. I understand if people have other commitments, but uh, you also, my email is right there. If you have questions or if you'd like additional information, feel free to shoot me an email.